Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very, very special guest today is legendary journalist Bob Schieffer. Thanks for being here, Bob. It's fun to be here and it's fun to be in Oklahoma. You've been to Oklahoma before, you Yes, know but not in a long, long time. You know, I grew up not far from here, down in Fort Worth, and went to TCU. So, um, you know, I would come to Oklahoma over the years, and uh, I think the last time I was here, probably 15 years ago. Well, in fact, you got your start in journalism in Fort Worth, the mm -hmm. Star-Telegram. Uh-huh. What kind of things did you cover down in Fort Worth? Well, I was a police reporter at the Star-Telegram, and uh, uh, before that, when I was in college, I had actually worked at a little radio station at night where I got on the three R's beat. That's what we call Rex, Rapes, and Robberies. Uh, we had these little <laughs> All the panel. inspirational stuff. We, yes. We had all the, these little panel trucks with police radios in them, and when we would listen <laughs> to the police radio, and when there was a wreck, we'd race to the scene and then broadcast live from the scene the results of these wrecks. I have probably covered more wrecks than any single person uh, in America, and that led <laughs> uh, to a job at the Star-Telegram, uh, as the night police reporter where I spent uh, some years and uh, it's still I think the police beat is still the best training uh, that you can get uh, in journalism. I think it's the best training you can get for any job quite frankly because you're always operating and coming into the worst moment in someone's life mm -hmm. and if you can conduct your business uh, in a business like way under those circumstances you can probably do it under any circumstance. You probably have to make some touch, tough uh, judgment calls, value judgments. In well, sure you like do. That. And, and uh, as I say, uh, the police reporter, he doesn't get invited anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a sports writer, uh, you get a free, free seat at the game. Mm -hmm. uh, the team has somebody there to help right. you keep the stats if you want it. They're glad to see you. They're happy to have you. Nobody's happy to see the police reporter when he comes. And uh, so that's why so many uh, young reporters start on the police beat. I still think it's uh, the best place to start. In your terrific book, This Just In, What I Couldn't Tell You on TV, you recall being in the Star-Telegram news office in the aftermath of the Kennedy mm -hmm. assassination, and phones are ringing like crazy, and you pick one up at random. Yes, I was just on the city desk trying to help out, and a woman said, is there anyone there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, well, lady. You know, we don't run a taxi service here, and besides, the President of the United States has just been killed. And she said, yes, I heard it on the radio. I think my son is the one they've arrested. And it was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. And so I went out to her home on the um, west side of Fort Worth, another reporter and I. We picked her up, and we actually drove her to Dallas that day. And things were so different in that day than they are mm -hmm. today. There were no PR spokesmen and things like that at the police department. I didn't even have a press card, quite frankly, uh, in those days. And so when I arrived with her at the Dallas police station, I didn't tell anybody who I was. I just said to the first uh, uniformed policeman, uh, I'm the one who brought uh, Oswald's mother over here. Is there some place we can put her where these reporters won't be bothering her? And they actually found me an office. They just assumed that I was a detective. <laughs> I always wore a snap brim hat in those days, yeah. so I'd look like Dick Tracy. And uh, and so uh, the result was the Star-Telegram had its own private phone inside the Dallas police station because they put us in this little room in the burglary squad. And, Teresa, the, the most unbelievable part of it is we'd been there about four hours. Nightfall was coming, and she said, I wonder if they'd let me talk to my son. And I said, well, I'll find out. So I went and asked the chief mm -hmm. of homicide. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, can she see her son? And he said, yeah, we probably ought to do that. So we were all ushered into this holding room off the jail. At this point, no one mm -hmm. had asked me even who I was. They just assumed I was a cop. And I'm thinking, my heavens, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to bring this man down, and I'm going to hear him. Maybe I'll get to interview him. Who knows? And finally, a guy standing in the corner said, well, who are you? And I said, well, who are you? And he said, well, are you a reporter? And, and I said, well, yes. And he said, son, he said, get out of here. He said, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. 
And it turned out he was an FBI agent who was doing his job. Finally. Uh, yeah. And so I always tell people that's the biggest story I almost got but didn't. But it was uh, what an adventure in the midst of that tragedy. Well, sure. And what was it like riding in the car with Mrs. Oswald? It's like an hour trip, isn't it, from yeah. Fort Worth to Dallas? She was really... Uh, she was mentally unbalanced. There's no question in my mind. On the on the way there, she began talking about how people would feel sorry for his wife and would give his wife money, and she wouldn't get any. And uh, mind you, I mean, the president of the United States, the body wasn't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cold yet, you know, mm -hmm. and she's worrying about is she going to get some money out of it. And uh, I think uh, the things she said were just so unbelievable that I actually didn't put some of them in the story. I just I thought this poor woman under this kind of pressure. Uh, the fact is, it was a good lesson. Uh, people, when they tell you something, you you know, they tell you, I guess, mm -hmm. because they want you to know it. And had I put some of those quotes in my story in the Star-Telegram the next day, we probably would have had a, a more of an insight into who Lee mm -hmm. Harvey Oswald was and, and why he was like he was. I mean, this woman was uh, would have been a terrible influence on anyone. And years later, I mean, even after I went to work at uh, CBS, she would still call me on the phone really? and see if, you know, ask, do you think they'd pay me to do an interview? And, of course, we never did. We don't do that. But uh, she lived out her life selling his clothes to souvenir hunters. She was, she, was, she was an evil person, I thought. As you look back on that time, are you convinced that Oswald was a lone gunman? I think Oswald was the gunman. I don't think there is any question he is the one that fired that shot from uh, from the Texas School Book Depository. And when you go up there now and look out that window, you realize uh, it was a very easy shot. You didn't have to be an expert mm -hmm. marksman to do it. Now, whether there was somebody else, uh, no one has yet shown me evidence to convince me that there was. But I haven't closed the book on it. Uh, it may, there may well have been someone, uh, someone else. Uh, who, what, why they were there, I have no idea. But uh, there could have been. But at this point, I've seen nothing uh, to convince me that there was. In your book, you say that the Kennedy, Kennedy assassination was the first news story that we all watched together mm -hmm. as a nation, and certainly it had an impact on the country. What was it like for you as a journalist? Well, it was terrifying. You know, uh, people forget, we didn't know what had happened here. The president had been shot. We had never gone through anything like this. Uh, they closed off the borders to Mexico. Uh, people wondered if this was somehow the beginning of World War III. We were at the height of the Cold War. Uh, don't forget. And uh, nobody knew what this was about. And uh, But what you do when you're a reporter is, you know, you just kind of focus on what's ahead of you and you put all your, try to put all your emotions aside and, and just try to focus on finding out what happened. And that's what we, we all did. But after it was all over and I was back in Fort Worth, I realized I had expended so much emotion and my adrenaline had been so high that I'd just run out of emotion. I had gone out to cover a horrible car wreck. And as they were bringing these bodies out, uh, I realized I, it didn't make any impression on me at all. It, it was mm -hmm. like a dog watching television. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw it, mm -hmm. but it didn't register with me. And, and I think uh, I think what happens in situations like that is we just use up so much of our emotion mm -hmm. uh, that uh, once it's over, we sort of have to replenish that. It, it's odd, but it was a long time before I really could have any feeling for anything after that. So eventually it came back. How did you make the transition from print journalism to television journalism? Well, I did it for the money. <laughs> Good reason. <laughs> and let me tell you why. I was working uh, at the Star-Telegram. I had come back from uh, Vietnam, and uh, a woman named Bobby Wygant had a noon talk show, and she asked me to come out and be on, mm -hmm. on her noon talk, uh, talk show and talk about Vietnam. I did. Afterward, they offered me a job. And it was $20 a week more than I made at the Star-Telegram. And I was, I didn't have any money. I was no. poor. I needed the money. So uh, that got me up to $155 a week. Right. I'd been making $135 a week. So uh, I, I did it for the 20 bucks. Was it a tricky transition for you, technically speaking? I mean, you get before a, a camera and suddenly you're, you're, people are seeing your face. You're not the person behind yeah. the story. I, you know, it's funny. I guess I, did, I knew so little about it that I wasn't scared. Oh. If, I, if I'd have known more about what I was getting into, I probably would have been terrified. But I didn't know that much about it, so I just started doing it and, and just sort of figured it out. And uh, uh, I was not only, I started out as the anchor, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, the, 
I was also the graphics artist, and the graphics artist, in a sense, that whenever we needed a, a picture of somebody, we'd you know we keep watch on the news magazines, and you know if Newsweek had a picture of of uh, some official, uh, I would just cut it out with a pair of scissors, paste it on a, a red or a blue background, and that would be our graphic. <laughs> well, it worked. <laughs> it worked, didn't it? it did. It's a lot more complicated today, I suppose. As Chief Washington Correspondent for CBS, you've covered all the major Washington venues, the White House, the Pentagon, the State Department, uh, Congress, all, all, of the, all of the hot spots. Do you think that's given you a broader perspective? Well, I think so. I think it helped me to understand Washington. I'm a big believer in beats. I believe beats uh, are the core of any news organization. Uh, you have to learn what the beat is about, and then you do stories about the beat as, as they occur. You can't just go walk in the Capitol and do uh, a story that brings any insight uh, by just walking in the door. You have to be there a while. You have mm -hmm. to understand who's who and who's against who, and, and, and the more you know about it, I think it just gives you a much better perspective. And I think all too often today, uh, we see both newspapers and television uh, stations at the local level. They just don't have enough reporters to really cover beats. And so they're sending somebody new to talk to the mayor every day or somebody new to talk to the county commissioners. And you just don't do as good a job that way. And, uh, I mean, you have to invest in, in putting people there knowing that they're not going to write a story every day. But they need to be there in case news breaks, and uh, I think that's one of the weaknesses of journalism today. Certainly all of our government institutions were under threat, or we felt they were during 9-11. In what way, if at all, did covering the Kennedy assassination better prepare you for covering 9-11? Well, I don't know if it, it made me better prepared, but those were the two stories that had the most impact on me personally and that were the hardest mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. You know, as reporters, we... We cover stories about other people, but on 9-11, that was a story about us. I mean, in, in New York, every single CBS reporter, producer, uh, photographer that went to Ground Zero had a life-threatening experience. Uh, some of them still have uh, this dust in their lungs and, and still have respiratory ailments. Uh, our director that day directed the first hour of that coverage thinking his own child had been killed. Mm. He couldn't find mm. her, and, and they found her. Uh, during during that hour. I mean, it was this kind of thing. Uh, I was in w Washington. Uh, I was driving up to the Capitol, trying to get up to the Capitol because I covered the Congress in those days. My uh, bureau chief called me on the phone and said, where are you? And I told her, I said, I'm at the foot of Capitol Hill trying to get through this, this traffic. Uh, she said, get out of there. We think there's another plane, and we think it may be headed for the Capitol. That was the one that those brave passengers pushed down and forced to crash uh, in Pennsylvania. My brother had been in the Pentagon on the Friday before this attack in the very room where that plane nosed in. Had these people done this on a Friday instead of a Tuesday, uh, he might be dead. Uh, and everybody has stories like that that was in Washington and New York. And, uh, you know, you, it's very, very difficult to cover that kind of story. David Martin, who was our uh, Pentagon correspondent, he said he saw this big... Uh, cloud go up, and he thought it was something that happened out on the highway, uh, that maybe a, a oil tanker or something had overturned, and he parked his car, and he saw all this smoke, and, he was, and then he realized something was wrong, and he said, then I started seeing all these bodies laying out on the grass around the Pentagon, and he said, you know, he said, I didn't know what to do, and said, then my reporter instincts kicked in, and I just started counting them. Well, that's how reporters work. But that doesn't mean it doesn't take a real toll on you emotionally. And I, oh, I those of us who were, were there, I mean, we'll never forget that. I think about it all the time. I bet so. And we just hope that, hope that it never happens again. Yeah. In addition to being a chief Washington correspondent, your news anchor for years, as Saturday evenings you were in our homes with CBS News, then you were the interim anchor on CBS as they made the transition from Dan Rather to Katie Couric. What have been some of the best times sitting behind that anchor desk? Well, that was one of the great adventures of my life. I, I loved every minute of it. It was a, a total surprise. I had no idea I was going to do it. When they called me and asked me to do it, they told me they expected it to last no longer than six weeks. Wow. <laughs> and it wound up lasting uh, a year and a half. But 
you know, it's like everything else. You kind of think you know everything there is to know about your profession. But I learned so much in that year and a half, actually sitting down behind that desk every night, starting out at 9 o'clock every morning, figuring out what you're going to put on the news that mm -hmm. night. Uh, it was it was just a, it was just a great experience for me. I wouldn't have wanted to do it uh, for very much longer. Uh, you know, as it wound up, I you know I was living in a hotel in New York, going back home on the weekends, and then doing Face the Nation from Washington on mm -hmm. Sunday. Usually, would write my commentary for Face the Nation on Saturday, so it was almost a six and a half day a week job, and it was very difficult for my wife. You oh, know, I can imagine. Uh, because our grandchildren, two of them are in Washington, and she kind of has her own schedule and trying to this going back and forth. It, it, it took its toll. But having said that, I wouldn't trade it for anything, you know. And it ended just right for me. Uh, had I been 50 years old, I would have uh, said, you know, I'd really like to have this mm -hmm. job for a while. But at my age, uh, they needed to pick someone who could be there for a while. And um, I'm 70 years old now, and. Uh, I mean, frankly, I wouldn't have picked myself. Uh, but uh, having said that, I thought it, it started as a surprise. It ended just right for me, and now I have just one job doing Face the Nation. And that, that's funny for an old fellow like me. So uh, I just loved it. Since you first started in journalism, there have been all kinds of technical mm -hmm. innovations. Do you think they've made for better journalism? I'm thinking particularly of war coverage. You mentioned going to Vietnam, and you've covered so many, so many big stories. Well, this this war is the hardest war that we've ever had to cover. More reporters have been killed in Iraq than in all the wars that America has been involved in. Uh, it is extremely dangerous, much more so than Vietnam was. I was there, and of course you could get shot at when you went out in the field, and, and we did. But you could at least come back to Saigon and kind of regroup, you know, and then go out again. Uh, our reporters don't go outside their hotels without armed guards. They don't go in a car unless they have a, a you know, a, a chase car and a car that goes in front of them. I mean, we maintain CBS, as do the other networks and the big newspapers, we maintain these little, almost what you'd call private armies uh, of these uh, mm -hmm. security people, mm -hmm. because you have to. The New York Times, I'm told, spends two, two and a half million dollars a year just on security. It's incredible. In order to keep their, their bureau operating there, and uh, we probably spend uh, that much or more. Uh, just, and that didn't count, you know, the salaries of the reporters, the cameramen, or any of that, just the security to keep our people there, and yet it's, it's so hard to get out into the field, but yeah, our reporters do that. Of course, you're the legendary moderator of Faith the Nation. Yeah. You came on board the show in 1991. You've written a great book, by mm -hmm. the way, on Faith the Nation. If you could look to that program and consider its longevity, it's what, 50 plus years it's mm -hmm. been on, on television. What did you think it is about Faith the Nation that has made it so durable? Well, it is uh, always... Uh, key to whatever the top news of, of the week is. And Frank Stanton, who created Face the Nation, did so because he said, uh, I think we ought to have some place where the key newsmaker of the week can explain in detail what he or she uh, means, why he's taken the position he's taken, why uh, they're doing what they're doing. And uh, there's no bells or whistles, uh, nothing fancy. We don't have a lot of graphics or anything. We still do it in much the same way mm -hmm. uh, that they did it when it was created in 1954. The first guest on Face the Nation was Senator Joe McCarthy, of all people. Wow. Wow. And uh, uh, we have uh, had this, just this long uh, tradition. It's the second oldest uh, program on television. The oldest is Meet the Press, which is, which is a very similar program. What I like about it is, is that it is the last place on television, and I, when I say this, I mean Sunday morning in that time period, where people can, can speak longer than three paragraphs. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, these little seven or eight second sound bites are fine, but Sunday morning is the only time on television that people, key newsmakers, can, can speak at some length uh, to a very large audience. You've interviewed most of the key leaders in the world. Are there any view, interviews that stand out as your, in your mind as, as key interviews for you personally? Well, the ones that um, people say, who's your, your favorite interview? My favorite interview is always uh, whoever happens to be president. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, if you can interview a sitting president, uh, that's always fun and it's always interesting because, you know, this is the most powerful leader in mm -hmm. the world and whatever he says is going to be news. 
So uh, I look back on uh, the interviews, and I've interviewed all of the presidents uh, uh, since Richard Nixon. My interview with Richard Nixon wasn't really an interview. I just asked him one question at the White House one time. <laughs> he wasn't on Face the Nation. But uh, I, I have interviewed all of them uh, since. And uh, I, I always, I mean, it's just kind of the, uh, maybe it's just the... Uh, gawker in me or the uh, just rubberneck, but I get a kick out of that. Do you see any overlapping characteristics in the presidents? Yes, they all come in uh, full of hope and idealism, and uh, they all uh, leave <laughs> not liking the press very much. <laughs> I think it's fair to say. It's a very, very difficult job. Uh, people ask me, has this administration been the most secretive? And in fact, it is. But the previous administration had been the most secretive up until that point, and the one before that was the most secretive up until that point. They all learned from the people uh, that, that, uh, that came before them, and uh, we have so many reporters in Washington now. The security is so heavy. It's, everything is so formalized. It's not very often, especially at the White House, that you have a chance to just sit down and talk to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. all very organized and it's all, all very formal. And, and some of that has to be, but some of it is by design. I mean, because we have become so sophisticated in the management of information, whether it's business or sports, uh, everybody has talking points now. Exactly. Uh, you know, when I came to Washington, most congressmen didn't even have press secretaries. And the Capitol is the last place in Washington where you can really uh, on a daily d basis, a uh, talk to the newsmakers, the elected officials face to face because you run into them in the hall, you stand outside the uh, uh, the floor of the senator house and catch them when they come from voting, and uh, you can still have that personal uh, contact. But it's very difficult now at any of the other beats. I mean, for example, when I came to Washington, the only building that you needed a security pass to get in was the White House. All the other buildings were mm -hmm. public buildings. You could just walk in. You could walk right in the front door of the Pentagon. I know you couldn't go down and get into what they call the tank, where the where the war room is yeah, and all of that. Yeah. But the rest of the building was a public building. You could walk right up to the office of the Secretary of Defense and ask to see, say, I'm here to see uh, the Secretary. Well, you're not going to get to see him. But, I mean, you know, it's that it was that uh, informal. Well, I bet one of your toughest assignments was moderating the presidential debate in 2004. You know, I think from the standpoint of just intellectual challenge, it was. It was also uh, one of the most interesting and the most fun things that, that I've ever done. And people, people often ask me, do you get uh, nervous when you're on television? Yeah, well, I was the, wondering. The fact is I don't. I mean, I've done it so long. Uh, it's like uh, a professional athlete. You learn how to play the game, then you learn how to play when other people are watching, and you don't, you don't think about that anymore. But that night, as I was standing backstage waiting for that to begin, I, I actually, I would say, for the first time in 25 years, had butterflies. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, once the red light went on, I, you know, I thought to myself, well, I, why am, I'm the umpire. Why should I be nervous? You know, <laughs> uh -huh. these guys are the ones that ought to be nervous. Uh, I later asked Senator Kerry, uh, I said, were you, you nervous uh, that night in that debate? And he, and he said, we keep kind of a Senator Kerry-like answer, yeah. you know. He said, well, on the one hand and on the other hand. I asked uh, President Bush a couple of months after that the same question. He said, hell yes, I was nervous. He said, how would you feel? <laughs> Which may be the reason he got elected. Uh, you know, even people that didn't agree with him uh, during that election, I think they, they understood what he said. And I think sometimes it was hard to discern what exactly what Senator Kerry's position was. And you've covered all the conventions since mm -hmm. 1972, I believe. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for in this upcoming convention? 68, then? actually. I went I to the 68. 68. Oh, I that, went to the uh, Democratic convention yeah. in 1968. With all the controversy. Yeah, in and it's in which is in some ways the uh, the one that's most remembered in my family. Uh, my wife and I uh, had been married a couple of years. We were convinced we were not going to have any children. <laughs> And so she had set up adoption proceedings in Fort Worth. It was the last thing she had done before we left to go mm -hmm. to the convention. Well, nine months of the day after that convention, our first daughter was born. Oh. It took uh, her, she was probably in high school when uh, she finally figured it out. And one day she said to her mother, you know, Mom, I guess it wasn't all fighting in the streets out there in Chicago. <laughs> what a great answer. <laughs> what, what are you anticipating in the 2008 conventions? 
I don't think much will happen. I think uh, we're probably going to know uh, by the first two weeks of February who the nominees are going to be. And I think that's one of the things that's gone wrong with our politics, Do these you? long campaigns. And, you know, uh, now they push all these primaries up earlier and earlier and earlier. So what do we do from February to August uh, when both parties are going to know who the nominee is? Uh, it used to be the state delegations came to the National Convention. They had real political business. It was fun to watch. It was suspenseful. It was entertaining. Now they've just become these long infomercials mm -hmm. uh, where really the only news is hearing the uh, speech that the uh, nominee in both parties makes uh, make. And uh, somehow, I, I just, uh, I think we can do better than what we're doing. I, I would like to see the whole system overhauled. I, I would like to see us stop primaries. That's when all this started going, uh, costing so much money. Uh, I'd like to go back to the old method, uh, pick them at the precinct level, then the county level, and send delegations to these national conventions uh, with real political business to do. I think it would just energize interest in politics uh, because it would be spontaneous and interesting. And I'll guarantee you, if we did that, the uh, the networks would cover it gavel to gavel like we used to. Bob, we just have a few seconds mm -hmm. left. I wonder if you could speak for a moment about your career as a singer-songwriter. Well, this all started as a joke. I was, I was being uh, roasted at a charity benefit in Washington, and I wrote kind of a gag song about a guy that worked in a uh, gas station and uh, a TV consultant came along and said, you look like a sincere person, we'll make you an anchor man. And uh, <laughs> anyway, it went over kind of well, and, and the little band that uh, helped me uh, perform this at this benefit, uh, they were getting ready to put out a CD, and they said, why don't you try to write some more songs for us? So I did, I wrote four more, and uh, they put them on the CD, and uh, who knows, we're, we're, we're waiting for that call from the Grand Ole Opry. So far, it hasn't come, but it's really been a lot of fun. Well, here's wishing that it does. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Bob, for being with us. It was great. And thank all of you for joining us on Riding Out Loud.